Hello and welcome to our first PNCA in practice evening featuring Matthew Letzelter and Blake Tupman. This program highlights their time at PNCA and all of the different ways in which they serve and work with the community. My name is Tiffany Newton and I lead the alumni and parent engagement team for both Willamette and PNCA. Today's conversations will focus, like I said, on their experiences both as folks who have gone through some of our programs and then as folks who are actively working with current students as professionals and academics. Matthew Letzelter is a Portland, Oregon artist and professional printer who explores his studio practice through works on paper, print, paintings, and photography with a focus on abstracted landscapes. Matthew received his MFA in 2003 from Pratt Institute in New York and his BFA in 1998 from the University of Florida College of Fine Arts in Gainesville, Florida. He's currently an associate professor at the Pacific Northwest College of Art, where he is chair of the MFA in Print Media Program, director of Watershed Center for Print, and director of the Post-Baccalaureate Residency. Blake Tupman is a soft sculpture artist, fashion designer, illustrator, admissions counselor, and teacher. Blake received his BFA in illustration from PNCA in 2020 and created a full fashion line for his thesis centered around emotional growth. Blake now sells his work at local pop-up shops as well as online. His current work focuses on embracing comfort and softness through clothing, plush toys, illustrations, and sculptural objects. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We're so looking forward to it. So we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what brought you to PNCA and your time there and where your current practice is. And if I may, I will start with Matthew. Um, As we shared, you lead the print media MFA program and Watershed. Can you tell us a bit about your journey to PNCA and what those current roles mean? Yeah, I took a long route through school from University of Florida, uh, kind of in the biology medicine area and kind of shifted over into the arts. Um, At the University of Florida, I just found that printmaking was kind of like the best of the arts and science together, which kind of drove me in that direction. Um, While kind of finishing up my studies there, I worked with Bob Mueller that was a Tamarin printer that really kind of pushed me towards printmaking, but also publishing. So making work with artists and kind of got me going at that point. And uh, that kind of drove me to New York. I was an assistant for a bunch of artists there. I went to Pratt. Uh, while at Pratt, I I was very lucky to get a position working at Derriere La Toile Studios, mm. uh, which is one of the renowned kind of lithography studios in New York City. Uh And then from there, just kind of kept kept connecting the community to other studios and artists and projects and uh, eventually moved up to Montreal and kind of ran a a professional studio up there and taught at Concordia University for a few years uh, before coming back and then shifting out this way. So it's been kind of a big journey up and around and all over the place. Um, Yeah, it's been 18. I'm on my 18th year at PNCA. So it's been a it's been a roller coaster ride of changes and all sorts of things um started in the foundation program chairing that uh moving into printmaking and then eventually developed the mfa and print media uh and then took on postback uh and through that journey we also developed watershed which is our kind of center for printing where we publish uh work with artists and do all sorts of things in there so Thank you for sharing that. Can you talk a little, you've kind of talked about how you got to PNCA, what that pathway looked like and what you currently do, but can you talk about your current work with students and what that looks like within those different aspects of your work? So print media is one of those programs that's very multidisciplinary. So I have artists coming in that are doing pretty much everything, but print becomes kind of the center focus that brings them all together. Um, And for those that have ever been on a print making studio it's a it's a community-based place you know everyone knows each other everyone comes in and works with each other um faculty staff everyone's always in there at all points and i'm sure blake knows this you know the tours it's the lively place on campus um yeah it's just you know all my students they have such a diverse background and and place with their work it just it's an exciting place to be you know it's it's 
printmaking with sculpture, installation, video and sound, painting, um, doing things on fabric. Uh, there's a lot of technology involved, you know, at any one point they're in cutting things with the laser cutter and bring it back into the studio to, to put on the press. Um, it's a, it's a pretty wild place to be. It sounds so fun though. And I, if I may, it's slight tangent. How was that impacted a little bit over COVID or have you all been able to kind of get back in studio and be, get back into that hands on? We, we were the lucky ones that stayed throughout the entire process. So it's been such a interesting journey of like going from a very lively campus to we were the only ones there. Uh, and I think, you know, we've had this alternate exchange with coming back of like, where'd our quiet space go? And we had the whole campus to ourselves. So, uh, you know, as we adjust to more people coming in, everyone else is adjusting to like, what does it mean to be with people? Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of, it's a, it's been an interesting ride through that. Um, yeah, we were just very lucky, be, you know, much like a lot of the science labs were a lab based program. Um, there was really no way to just go completely on zoom and teach that way. So we had a lot of protocols set up in place and we have a really healthy ventilated studio and, uh, you know, did really well with that. And I have to imagine that, that that was also a very grounded benefit to the students who didn't lose access to all of those expensive, highly, you know, developed technologies and things that you may not have in your garage or your room at yeah. home. Or <laughs> It was a huge benefit. And I think, I think, you know, looking at the way the other programs have had to adjust over the last couple of years, like I think uh, it, it definitely helped us quite a bit and supported our students in ways that uh, they might have missed out. And, you know, mm -hmm. Zoom is great, but being in person and hands on just it makes such a huge difference. It does. And someone asked a quick question. Was it just the graduate level students who were able to take advantage of that? Or were there also undergraduates who were able to be in? in it, it was a mix. I would say the graduate programs, uh, printmaking in particular, had probably the most access. But uh, there were undergrads that slowly kind of went through. Yeah. I would say it would, I think the grad students felt more comfortable for some reason, maybe because they're in a community cohort. Mm. Uh, where it was kind of just one big kind of bubble <laughs> versus kind of shifting across all of campus. Um, so it was kind of helpful for, for us to be in a group that, you know, we didn't didn't have to mix with a lot of other groups. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was it was open, but it was definitely it was more uh, print media based from from interacting on the in the lab. That's fascinating. And so in thinking about that, is there a particular story or a moment or something that's happened recently that might highlight what it is like to work in that medium yourself or with a student in, in one of those mediums? Because a lot of the folks on with us are alums of the program, but some who may watch this may not have a, a very clear idea. Yeah, you know, it's uh, everything we do is a process, uh, you know, a lot of stuff we do is painting, drawing, sculpture, mm -hmm. mark making, but it goes through this process that takes, you know, usually teams of people to do. So it's a very collaborative process and um, you really have to be there with other people to kind of make things happen. So it's like taking, taking the traditional arts and then adding it to this old technology or new technology. Uh, and it's it's something that uh, has really kind of kept us connected in different ways. And I think that's why the printmaking lab itself is always a big community, just because you have to work together. You have to kind of uh, depend on others to get uh, a certain amount of the work done. It's just a different way of making that uh, I think has kept me alive and going in that field for so long. <laughs> I don't know if I'd survive in a private studio. <laughs> I couldn't survive without others either. Um, but in thinking about that practice also, and, and all of the work that you do on the publishing side yeah. of things with Watershed, I mean, it, it seems like you're also then creating these things that are tangible products of, you know, the great creativity of the community, but then they last or, or they can have impact for a long period of time. Can you talk a little bit about Watershed? Yeah, so Watershed is basically our in-house publishing center. Um, it's it's a pretty dynamic system where we bring artists in. Um, the students take classes and actually produce work with the artists side by side. Mm -hmm. So it's this reciprocal engagement of making that 
Um, it forces students to do things they wouldn't do with their own work. <laughs> um, it puts them on a spot to reach a level of professionalism that uh, they might not do normally. Um, it gets them in touch with these new contacts, these artists that, uh, you know, it's not, it's not like just going to a lecture and asking a question and saying hello to someone. It's like they're there multiple days in a row, uh, you know, and all of these other conversations pop up out of it as they're making the work and uh, the students get to experience um, a different way of making. They get the intimate kind of behind the scenes look at like, why are they making this work and how do they make it? Um, it's just, it's a huge benefit to the students that get to publish and collaborate with these artists, uh, and get this different experience that, uh, it's something you really can't teach in a normal classroom. You can talk about it. You know, there's thousands of textbooks that talk about prints and publishing and these kind of, uh, collaborations, but, uh, to actually have the experience, it's just, it just changes things. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets it gets them to a point that is so different than just taking a print course. Um, yeah, it really puts them on the spot and pushes them to areas that they would never expect. And, you know, sometimes it's great. And sometimes you're like, OK, let me step in and take over. <laughs> yep. um, and it's always, you know, it's a lot of navigating of who we invite. I always have to make sure that the artist that's coming in is able to handle the situation as well. You know, part of my job before getting an education was doing this uh, in a pretty famous studio. So uh, a lot of big names came through that and certain artists had to have their quiet time and other artists loved people being around. But it was always that kind of knowing where the, the line is of who's making the work and who's assisting and how do I how do I move that along? And, you know, everything from time man management to budget control to making sure something actually happens. So. <laughs> well, and it seems like such a tangible way to get around, like what is the day in, day out, day in, day out reality of being a creative yeah. and what that looks like when things are going great or they're not, or you have someone that has a really different viewpoint than you or a machine is not working or yep. technology is not being your friend. It, it, and then having people who are professionals who are willing to be in that mess a little bit or in that process with students and kind of bring them along. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty common thing that even the simple approaches to making something, you never know what the artist is going to ask. Mm -hmm. And that takes you down this rabbit hole of like, Oh, now we're here. How do we do this? Um, so it, it's a lot of problem solving. It's a lot of like managing that time and problem solving of like, well, I know we can do this. So let's try it. Let's, let's experiment. Uh, but I have to figure out like, how do we do it again and again and again, because uh, it's easy to make one, but we're additioning. So, you know, we're coming out with a, a set of original prints and it could be anywhere from 20 to 200. Uh, so I need to make sure that not only can we figure out how to make one happen, but how do we, you know, multiply it. Well, and again, I just think students, if they open themselves up to being a little uncomfortable, get so much more of a deep, nuanced yeah. experience from it, it. It's almost like a practical and other modalities where you're you're shadowing someone to really see how deep the work goes and, and what they do. Yeah, you know, it really connects back to that kind of atelier system mm -hmm. of, of being in the work and experiencing it. And it's just you know, I think they need all these courses to get up to this point, but, you know, as they become more advanced students, um, it just, it's a different way of being in the studio. And once you have that experience, then it's, it, it just changes the way you do your own work. Yeah. And all of those conversations that you would miss if you weren't in practice with someone or seeing yeah. them go through it as well. I know we did have, um, someone ask a very specific question about the Paul Maloney, yeah. Uh, collaboration. If you could speak on that a little bit. And then we have one other one and then we'll get to Blake here in a okay. second. Yeah. Paul Maloney, uh, Maloney Printing. They have a studio not too far up the street from us. Um, Paul moved up from San Francisco, uh, also was in a handful of other places. But Paul's a really well known master printer. Um, and one of our first alums out of the print media program is now kind of co owner of the space or co collaborator, so to speak. Uh, Harry Schneider. Um, and the two of them now run Maloney Printing. And uh, we have set up a lot of different tangents with them. Both of them teach within our print lab. Uh, they're mentors, but we also co-collaborate. So 
Um, we just recently brought an artist out from the East Coast, um, Cheryl Roland, and certain projects I can do on site. And then there's other projects that need a lot more kind of daily time to actually happen because I have to navigate classrooms and classes and everything else. Um, so we kind of shifted that one to Paul's studio and, and uh, we're still in the middle of proofing that to, to go up for his exhibition coming up in a few months. Uh, but there's a lot of a lot of more things happening there. He's got internships um and we're developing maybe some fellowships and uh a lot a lot more going on with paul's studio um so more and more is going to come out on that one but yeah we we are co-collaborators uh we instigate things quite a bit together uh you know not too long ago we had allison saw on site uh and had a chance to have her making work in our studio and then some of that went back to paul's studio uh and there's some beautiful additions that came out of that, that experience um Sandel Burke. Uh, there's been quite a few artists that we've kind of gone back and forth. Yeah. Storm Tharp, uh, we had for a while. Now Storm just finished a whole series of Paul's that was up at the print fair at the museum recently. Um, yeah, it's 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 nice to have them in, on site. And then I never know when I, I'm going to call them or they're going to call me because they're stuck in a project and can't figure something out. And we're, yeah. we're like trying to figure it out together. So I think that's the best part about a really creative local community is being yeah. able to have all of that overlap, problem solving, get to know folks so you can contact them. Um, speaking of which, someone was asking, you kind of start getting into it, about examples of internships or employment opportunities that come through the, the print media um, program track, if you could talk about that just really. Yeah, quick. so we definitely, we have the tracks going in the uh, Maloney printing, uh, and we're trying to develop more with that, uh, both internships and then kind of post, post-grad opportunities. Um, we've done a little bit with Newhouse Press with Chris mm -hmm. Chandler's space, and I've, I've kind of sent a handful of students through that space, which has been amazing. Uh, and now Chris is showing with um, Elizabeth Leach, so he's kind of taken more of a um, shift towards his own work, but still has a, a handful of our studios kind of supporting that place, which is amazing to have. Um, there, there's a lot of other, so, you know, working in New York, um, I made a lot of connections with the, the larger kind of professional network of, uh, printmaking studios. So, you know, we've placed students down at Gemini, uh, in LA, Cirrus Editions, um, we recently had some students at Crown Point in San Francisco. Uh, I've been trying to get a handful out to New York, but that's a little bit tougher to get them there. Um, we have a student in Philadelphia working at a print center there. So it's, you know, it's, it's a community and it's, it's there. We're all connected to some degree. So anytime a position opens up, I hear about it. And then I'm like, I have someone like interview them. Um, but then we're, you know, we're, we're still developing more kind of pathways for while they're in the program that they get this experience. And that's where Maloney is uh, really great about that. So um, wow. they get the credit and get to go over there, you know, a handful of times of the week or, you know, maybe an intensive over the summer. That's amazing. And it's great to see how it impacts current students. But then as they become their own full-time practicing professionals, yeah. They then create space and, and programs and pathways for other folks yeah. as well. You know, we, we're one of the few fields that also has conferences. So mm -hmm. every year in the fall and spring, there's a printmaking conference that we go to. And it's amazing to go to those and then see our alums that are teaching somewhere else and bringing their students to the conference. And, you know, I go and I see faculty I had years ago and it's it's it becomes a big community and it's it's nice to kind of have that experience. I appreciate that. I'm going to switch gear. Thank you so much. I'm going to switch gears yep. a little bit to Blake because he is, is kind of at the beginning of that cycle and talking to prospective students, but then also having your own artist journey. Um, and I know we mentioned briefly that you do admission work at PNCA. So I was wondering if you could tap into that just a little bit and how you speak with prospective students and others about how they could envision their own artistic pathway, what that could look like, and, and how PNCA might fit into that. Oh, I'm so sorry, Blake, you're muted. I was muted. <laughs> Gotta happen at least once in a Zoom thing. <laughs> anyway, what was I saying? Um, okay, um, usually when I'm Talking with students, I'm bringing in like my own experiences and just making sure that it's like a community that makes the most sense for them. I'm also like D 
deep diving into their creative practice. We're talking a lot about their work. I'm like doing portfolio reviews with them, giving them feedback on their work and like pushing them in the right directions um, to make sure that they're like ready for that art school experience. Um, that's like the most important part I feel is like making sure they're like, they have the expectations, they're thinking deeply about their work um, and they really know like what they're jumping into. It's an amazing thing, but you've got to be ready for it. <laughs> It's exciting. Can you, and, and I kind of skipped over it, can you talk a little bit about your own pathway to PNCA and your experience as a student and how, I'm assuming you really liked your time there because you're still with PNCA. Yeah, yeah I haven't left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, when I was 18, like right out of high school, I like moved up to Portland to go to PNCA. I grew up in Southern California, so it was a little bit of a, quite the drive up. <laughs> Um, but once I got here, I like really fell in love with like the PNC community and then Portland, the Portland arts community as a whole. Um, I'm really into like the more like small business pop up shop type scene. Um, and Portland's really, really great for that. I really like found my community here. And then once I was like within the PNC community, I wanted to be in involved as possible. So I immediately did a bunch of work study opportunities and um, as well as like joined the student council and did a bunch of like student leadership things and then just like I don't know I I, I couldn't leave the community I was like I need to stay so then <laughs> started working with PNCA and like working with students and it's always really inspiring to see the like new students work the transfer students and also those students coming right from high school they have such like inspiring portfolios that I definitely like I get inspired for my own creative practice as well as work to inspire them in theirs. Yeah. I I loved my time in admissions because you're kind of helping people think through their dreams and then find some practical steps to kind of help them along the way. And we all end up in different places maybe than we thought we would. <laughs> um, but it's so exciting to kind of see that blossoming happen and see them make their own connections and join a community that you've really you know invested in and, and become a deep part of. Um, can you talk a little bit about your own artistic practice and kind of where you've taken it? I got a chance to look at your website yeah. and it's so fun and bright. And yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of my work, it's always been like that more like focus in on like cuteness and embracing childhood. But like throughout my time at PNCA and throughout my throughout my time as, as a student at PNCA and then throughout my time working at PNCA, it's like blossomed, blossomed in so many different directions. Um, like when I first came to PNCA, I was like only drawing, like traditional drawing, mm. that was it. Um, and then I just, it the community really opened my eyes up to like all ways of making. Um, during my time as a student, I made sure to work in every single studio space. I studied illustration, but I did so much textile work over in the sculpture department. I did a lot of printmaking. I did a lot in Make Think Code. I really hopped around and I still hop around all the studio spaces. Like a lot of my practice is about exploring as many ways of making as possible. Um, and I'm trying to like always bring something new and exciting into my work. I don't want to be like stuck in one zone. I feel like I need to like really hop around. <laughs> Well, and that's also, I think, so rich for your job at PNCA, because if you think about it, you can talk about, like you said, your own experiences, maybe when something went well, if you had an issue with a certain machine, a yeah, professor yeah. that you took that you really enjoyed. Is there a special moment that you kind of draw on often or a story that you like to tell when you're thinking about PNCA and, and the community? Yeah, definitely. I almost always go back to my like freshman year. I took um, 3D design. It's one of those required courses. I'd never done any sculpture in my life, um, but I took a class with Nan Curtis. She's cool. <laughs> um, and she really like got me like into that like sculpture, like way of making. Um, none of all my work was flat before. And now almost everything now I make is three dimensional in some way. <laughs> Um, and really like sparked that joy that is like driving most of my practice now. Did a lot of textile work in that class, um, made a lot of clothing, and now that's a lot of what I do. Wow. So it was one of those where, again, like maybe what Matthew's trying to do with his students, getting out of your comfort zone, trying something new, and then potentially falling absolutely in love with it and, and taking it from there. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. Um, so if there, is there any stories or anecdotes you could share or something that's really cool about 
the current, you know, first year class or prospective students. I know I had shared, um, sometimes you just hear this great story about a particular prospective student or someone that's in the class, or they kind of open your eyes and teach you about something that you hadn't considered through that process. Yeah, um, this is less of like an individual student and more of like an in general, like students have been like, are coming in with like increasingly and increasingly impressive bodies of work. Mm-hmm. Um, they're very like concept, like they have, they're very like conceptually strong. It's like more so than like previous years. I think something about the pandemic and the like emotional hardships that so many students have gone through, they're like creative. I guess it's like a a small blessing within <laughs> the hard times. Um, it's been so like such impressive portfolio, such strong, emotional, like impactful, deep work um, that I'm like talking with students about and like seeing them um, just like share their work. And they're becoming more and more um, in tune to talking about their work as well, um, which has been like really great. <laughs> It's so exciting. And could you, for those of us who maybe aren't in the art world, could you explain what a portfolio review is or what that might look like? Yeah. Yeah. So for our, um, I work with undergrad students, um, our requirements, every school has different requirements, but our requirements is between 10 and 15 images or videos of their work. Um, so it doesn't have to pertain to one specific theme. Um, it's just the strongest work that they're working on, what they're most excited about. Um, and it's a wide variety. Some students will have mainly just drawing. Some students will have like a really great mix. Lately, a lot of students have been having a ton of different work within their portfolio, which has been um, really, really great. <laughs> it's always good to see work that has like some sculptures, some printmaking, some photography, some video. A lot of students are thinking really interdisciplinary and like working in a variety of ways. Now, do you think, I'm just trying to think of when I went to college, we won't say how many decades ago that was versus now, but I mean, there's so much social media, there's YouTube channels, there's all these different ways that even if you grew up in a small rural town like I did, you might have more access to different mediums, to different knowledge, not saying that you can completely replicate an art school experience, but even just introducing people to some of these thoughts and concepts is a very different an ecosystem or environment than it was. Yes. Yeah, definitely. When I when I was like applying to schools, um, I didn't even know what printmaking was. <laughs> um, but now so many students like coming right from high school, they've already done some like printmaking. Um, they have like cool, like they have really cool work. Um, some students are doing like cyanotype work through photography. And it's it's just amazing so many different art practices that students are getting. And some of the, like a lot of them, I, I like, I'm meeting with them and asking about their classes and they're just, they don't, even if their schools don't have like access to those ways of making, they're, they're finding them themselves. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I think of like 3D printers and some of the different technologies that people, not saying it's completely affordable, but there are maker spaces or libraries have some of this technology. There are places to to start getting into to those um, modalities. It's It just seems like it's completely changed in a lot of ways. Yes, definitely. There's like, I don't know, so many, feels like there's such m- like there's more access for so many different students um, and that starts them off at a point where I'm like this is like in the future there it's going to be even more amazing work because they're starting with such amazing work. Well and that's the fun part seeing how much further they might be able to go because they were introduced to it early yeah. and they have kind of just so many more options for them to delve mm-hmm. into and, and different things. Um, is there anything else that you want to share about your current practice, your job, the work that you do at PNCA before I kind of get into questions for both of you? Yeah, um, I think we, I think we like covered most of it. Yeah. <laughs> we've been moving right along. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I am, it, we've kind of, of course, gone into details about, about this, but I want to ask both of you if there's anything that you want to share a really that highlights the impact specifically that PNCA has had, whether you're almost two decades in, you know, connected with the community or closer to, you know, five to seven years um, anything that just kind of crystallizes that for you? Big questions. You want to go, Blake? 
Uh, we went into a little bit about like how much it did for my like creative practice. Um, but just like being in a community with so many different artists, like I feel like I'm inspired every day. Um, even if I'm not reviewing any like portfolios that day, just like talking to people within the creative sphere, interesting ideas, taking those ideas in and thinking of bringing that into my work, into my like creative practice and into like when I'm like teaching, I teach quite a few classes through our community education program. So I'm definitely inspired by those students as well. Um, so that's like another part of the community. Yeah, I can just kind of follow up. Uh, Portland and kind of the Pacific Northwest has such a, a rich history of the arts and printmaking and so many different ways of doing craft and art that, uh, you know, coming out here 20, 18, 20 years ago, you know, I was kind of the New York artist uh, coming from Brooklyn and I was just, you know, so it took time for me to kind of adjust and figure out where I was and just things are so different from East Coast to West Coast, um, uh, different pace, different way of being. Um, but I, I have to say, like over the last two decades, like the the networking, the community, it's just it's kind of enriched what I do and how I how I am, you know. So when I when I do go back to New York for a print fair or an event or somewhere around the country, like, you know, Portland's become my home. And it comes with a whole community and group of colleagues that I work with. So that's wonderful to hear. And I think to take off on that, when you enter PNCA, as I've shared, I've worked at a bunch of different universities, and there is just such a strong sense of place and space making. And in all of the, you know, just looking at the bulletin boards for student organizations and the events that they're doing to first Thursdays and diving into all of the different things that can be going on on a Thursday night in the building versus everything else. It is just such a vibrant center to be in. And it's right in downtown Portland. There's so much going on around there. It, it just seems so rich for almost accidental but wonderful opportunities to really dive into things. If I think about going over to the glass building or going over to different um, galleries that are run by alums or feature all kinds of different student and alumni work, going to one of the museums that, I mean, practically any of the museums around Portland have some kind of PNCA connected artist or creative showcased in them or as part of their permanent collection. It is just such a vibrant place to be. Yeah, it's it's hard not to go anywhere and not have a connection, uh, which is a good thing. <laughs> the best kind of no anonymity, like you know, really known and connected. <laughs> um, so in in just talking about, I mean, we bounce all over the place, and of course, folks who are on um, with us are welcome to keep submitting their questions. Um, one of which I, I love that. Uh, Someone just kindly shared that they have a ceramic piece for you, Blake. So we'll make sure to, to, to follow up there. It's a community that always cares and gives and, and stays connected. Um, but in thinking about all of the different things that are currently happening, the stuff that folks have gone through with the pandemic, is there anything that's coming up soon that either of you are really excited about or you're really interested in? I know we'll kind of start learning who our incoming class is over the next few months. But I, I don't know if there are other things that you both are kind of tapped into. Well, you know, we're heading towards kind of the thesis events for both undergrad and graduate schools. So that's always a great time of year to kind of see the culmination of, you know, what happens. Um, Focus week was like a week long event of all the undergrads showing their thesis projects or proposing. And then uh, the grad students go go up at the the last week of school. So. Um, you get to kind of see like what it's all about and kind of that end points of and new beginnings. So that's definitely coming up. And I noticed uh, Linda mentioned that uh, Tom Prochaska's show is coming up at the Halle Ford Museum. Uh, I was lucky to work with Tom years ago, uh, Tom and, and Christy Wyckoff. They were kind of early mentors of mine at PNCA. Uh, they both were the full-time faculty when I came in. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that. And getting students to kind of go down and see that. I love that. Um, is there anything, Blake, that's coming up for you or that we should yeah. have on our radar? Well, I mean, every year I'm always excited to see like the new class of students coming in. Um, 
I personally am excited for I'm teaching another CE class starting next month um, that's about um, textile printing on like fabric digitally through digital illustration and then garment production. So like half of it is going to be digital illustration and printing and then the other half is going to be like making garments. And I'm just really excited to see what the students make. I'm always excited to like see what they come up with and draw inspiration for it and like give inspiration. That's so exciting. And it's also one of those things I wouldn't have thought, you know, I even 10 years ago, wouldn't have thought of making my own pattern and fabric and how that would work. And now people can customize almost anything, or you can 3D print a tool that's specific to your use or a slight modification for, you know, a piece of technology or a camera or something that you're using. There's just so many different ways people are, are getting the creative bug and really designing exactly what they need so that they can have their, their visions kind of come to life. Um, Oh, we, I'm trying to read We got a long comment. I'm like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so yes, one of the participants, if just to be slightly technical for a second is asking why they they can't interact. And I'm so sorry, just for um, intellectual property reasons and recording permissions, we don't have everyone's camera and mic on for those joining us. But please know, um, we have, we'll have other opportunities to check in and see folks live. We are going to be inviting the community and alumni in for Focus Week and for the MFA um, thesis preview that happens with first Thursday in May and some of the other stuff that's going on. There's going to be an amazing show also um, titled Arrowhead that first week of April that looks at Indigenous artworks and artists. Um, so there's all kinds of different things that we will share, but I'm so sorry, this is a slightly limited uh, modality for us at this moment. Um, is there anything either of you want to, to dive into? Because we, we, we've been talking so quickly and have gotten through so many different things, but if there's other examples or things that you want to share, talk about um, different connections. Well, we are currently finishing up a proof of uh, Ursula Le Guin's maps um, uh, through Theo Le Guin. Uh, so we're really excited to kind of get to this point to hopefully have the go ahead to actually do the additions. Uh, and I think those are going to be uh, sold through. I don't know if the if it's the, through the foundation. Uh, we'll be we'll be announcing more information on that, but. It's been kind of a multi-month process of trying to figure out how to how to produce these pieces of artwork uh, that Ursula drew years ago for her books and try to try to make them the way that the artist intended to do that. So that's been a really great experience in getting students kind of involved with finding new programs to do this color separations and things that Adobe Photoshop might not be able to fully do. And mm -hmm. um so yeah, we're we're at that kind of amazing point of getting to the end of like we got it and we're going to show it and see if we get the okay to move forward with additioning. So uh, there'll be more coming out on our Instagram site and other sites for that one. And forgive me for asking the follow up question. Can you tell people who Ursula Le Guin is? Um, <laughs> I probably can't even do justice yes. to this. Uh, uh, incredible sci fi writer, uh, local international beloved uh and then theo Le Guin, her son was is also an amazing kind of support of the arts had a gallery in town up for gallery um yeah just just incredible family but having the opportunity to you know get to to move towards printing these pieces that are extremely special um seeing the original drawings and finding ways to kind of you know, translate that into an addition uh, with with the intentions of what hopefully the artist expected. Um, yeah, it's just been an amazing experience. And, and also what an exciting thing to do with students or with others. If you think, yeah. it's, you know, such an established, well-loved, respected person going through archival or, you know, just their collected materials and then showing what that process of curation of going through, you know, dotting I's, crossing T's, everything that comes into the development of that kind of a big project. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 been a it's been a long journey and uh, learned a lot from it, just like new techniques, which kind of going back to that uh, 
kind of experimentation and collaboration and you just never know what you're going to get into. And it kind of puts you into directions that you don't expect. Yeah. That's so exciting. Um, so I'm just going through all of the different questions that we've collected and making sure I'm not missing anything. Um, if I can, let's talk a little bit about something that maybe either of you learned through your practice or through the work that you currently do that was a little surprising for you, good or bad or a learning moment. Um, but I'm trying to think of, like, I can think of all of the black and white photography I used to do and, and different things and how much that has changed because I used to be smelling of chemicals in a dark room. <laughs> and now you can do so much of that in Photoshop and in other modalities. But if there's anything that strikes either of you that you're willing to share and let us know. Oh, I could go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, my, my first days in art school, I was working with a uh, pretty well-known faculty photographer, Jerry Olsman. And I remember Adobe coming to him saying, can you be our kind of spokesperson? Because this is what Jerry did with his negatives. Uh, if anyone knows Jerry Olsman's work, um, you can go right back to his work and kind of find the roots of Photoshop and, and seeing that change you know, two decades later, actually three decades at this point, <laughs> date myself there. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing with technology. You know, I think I look back at early on when we started developing the Make Think Code Lab, I was kind of one of the co-collaborators on that space and uh, had a chance to buy the first 3D printer on campus. And just, just seeing how that has changed over time uh, has been pretty phenomenal. You know, even inkjet printers, you know, I remember, you know, it used to be like an iris printer that threw ink out all over the place on a drum. And then Epson came out and it's just been con kind of continuing from that state to now, you know, pretty, pretty normal that we're making film or printing a base layer off an inkjet printer to do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, these things were untouchable before that students couldn't get near it. And now it's like we can't get enough of them in. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I just love the idea of something that, it, I mean, re required very high technical aptitude and expertise. And if I think of, I hope he's the one that created the masking tool because I'll be forever thankful and everything else. But um, just, just how much of a specialist you needed to be to get that granular in the work and developing your own skills. And not to say there isn't a skill set to be able to use Photoshop well, but it's just so expansive and available yeah. to so many more people. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny, those tools have gotten so expansive that I always have to tell students, like, find what works for you. Don't don't worry about learning every aspect of it. Otherwise, you'll never, never get anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it just it does so much. So it's like, you know, I think there's certain pathways of picking up the skill sets, but mm -hmm. you might not use every tool on it now. There's just way, way too many options. Yeah. Well, in the adaptability, like what is the right tool for the moment? What will work, if not perfectly, but enough to get where you want to go? And then how you you triage and, and think through that and, and what else you can bring to it. Or if you're hitting some barriers, how else you can work around it or try to adjust to that. That has to be such a huge part of the art school experience, like just that giving it a go. And if it doesn't work out, what else can you do? <laughs> I feel like in a lot of um, my, like, as I was learning the more, um, like, digital, like, drawing, like, with Photoshop and Illustrator, more of it was about how to use tools, not how they were intended to be used, and not how to use tools how they, with their intended use, because um, you can create such more interesting, like, like, visually, like, visually interesting pieces just by using tools and like totally not how you're supposed to use them, like break things, make it weird. Yeah. Well, and there's two sides of it. There's getting funky and weird with it and exploring boundaries and what makes sense. But then I also remember in like desktop publishing and stuff, what is the professional aptitude and what do I need to know? So it'll come out right in a newspaper or it'll come out right in a magazine print or, oh my goodness, how to get the colors to actually look like they're supposed to look or match Panatone or, you know, all those different things. There's just so much going on there to where you're playing with it, but then you also get technically proficient enough to be able to, you know, make money off of it and, and, and to have that be part of your creative practice and to have other people think, oh, I have some really slick skills here and I'm putting together something that's 
that, you know, they enjoy as well. Um, is there, so we've got about 10 more minutes or so. We can go into a bunch of different directions. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about, since you both talk about your community, especially, you know, East Coast to West Coast, going to conferences, meeting prospective students, now that they're professional practitioners, all these different things. How do either of you kind of use those community connections and, and maintain those both, you know, for your own creative practice, but then in the work that you do. Well, I could say Instagram has been a big help. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, you know, within the printmaking community, Instagram is kind of like the app that everyone connects to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everything from recruitment for my program to seeing what all my colleagues are doing around the country. You know, that's that's the instant one. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, still still email, still go and visit and see people. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm sure Blake might know some of this, but just, you know, being on the road to recruit, I get to you know kind of go to these places where my friends are and visit with their students and see what's going on. And it's just, you know, maintaining that connection that way to travel, go, going to big events, uh, you know, in New York, you know, there's a, a yearly print fair that I go to and it's amazing to see this kind of international community come back together every year. I don't know. We're giving you a moment, Blake, if there's anything you want to add before I, mean, I jump you, in. You a lot of it. Um, I, I wish I didn't have to spend so much time on Instagram. I will say that. Um, that is a, a really great way to connect. Um, I, I'll try to like, I'll try to like live stream on there some and like also like post and stuff like that. Try to keep everyone up to date and also get up to date on other folks. Um, a lot, all, most weekends I'm doing some sort of like pop-up shop. Um, mm -hmm. So I connect with a lot of my like fellow artists in that environment, set up my table, walk around a little bit, maybe like buy too many things and then sell my things. <laughs> That happens to me at every conference or when there there's like a, a maker's fair or something. I have to sometimes limit myself so I don't go a little too far or come yeah. or I need to remember what kind of car I have or if I'm flying or not. So what like, can I fit in my bag yeah. or in the backseat? I, I always gotta make sure, okay, I gotta sell more than what I'm what I'm buying here. <laughs> Or, we, you know, we have that wonderful holiday, uh, the student holiday art sale. And I'm always at, like, I know um, we get to do the preview because, of course, we we work within PNCA. But I'm always on the hunt for earrings or gifts or all kinds of things. And it's so fun to see how vastly different each student's booth is. And then just all of the cool stuff that you can come up with. But it's almost delightfully dangerous to go into the space with all of these students and be like, oh, no. What am I going to come with today? <laughs> but I think that's the best part. I, I will say PNCA and, you know, coming from the Willamette side of things, it has been such a cool way to get to know a completely different but still aligned community. We're still invested in students. We're still invested in a thriving community at all kinds of different levels and with all kinds of different, you know, facets and, and focuses on different things. Um, but it's just so fun to be up in that building and see what's going on. And half the time I've been in there and, a, you know, someone's setting up a fashion show or, or like practicing something like that. There's paint on a table. Someone else has something going on. Everyone's eating. Like, it's just so fun <laughs> to be in that space. But. So I will just say, um, I, I think we've kind of covered most of the things that we were going to speak on. We've talked a little bit about your pathways to PNCA, your current work, what's exciting, working with students, developing, maintaining, and, and kind of, you know, infusing a little more energy into networks, those kinds of things. Some of the special collaborations or opportunities that come out of the unique community we all get to be a part of. Is there anything else that you would like to add to the conversation before we start wrapping up? I think we hit a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, <team. laughs> I know. I'm just trying to think. I, you know, we've hit all of the things on my checklist, which is amazing. But I just wanted to make sure that if there was anything else from those who are on with us still or from either of you that I, I don't, you know roll us out before we're ready. 
Yeah, there's a lot going on. So for those that want to come in and kind of take a tour and see what we're doing, you're always welcome to. Yeah. And I will say for those who are online, um, we have put in Sayer Cohen's email address a few times. She would be happy to facilitate that. She's up at PNCA regularly and we can work with the admissions office who do all kinds of tours and different things. And then others to um, make sure that you stay in the know and get a chance to have a really lovely visit if you want to stop by. So with that, thank you both for a wonderful conversation of all of the cool things that you're doing. I think I need to stop by some offices and see what's going on <laughs> on my next visit to PNCA, which will be in a week. Um, and with that, I will just close it out. And for those of us who, for those of you who joined us online, thank you so much for giving us your time and attention. This will be recorded and shared later. If you have future programming ideas or other thoughts or things that you are doing in your own life and through your connection with PNCA that you'd like us to know about, please feel free to share them. And with that, we hope you all have a lovely evening. Stay safe, stay healthy. Um, and we hope to see you soon, either online or in person at PNCA. Thank you so much, everyone.